Last Sunday, I started a sermon series on growing deeper. Today, we're going to talk about growing deeper in your Bible study. You know, the Bible is the most, in my opinion, the most interesting of all books because it shares with us not only the story of God, the plan and the purpose of God, but actually it is God's Word to us. It is living. It is alive. It it. It helps us discover God's plan for ourselves. It helps us know about God himself. And if we're going to grow in our faith, if we're going to grow deeper, we need a deeper and better understanding of the Bible and who God is and what God wants us to know. Now, when along my journey of faith, there have been some scriptures that just popped out at me. And then there have been many scriptures that I've read that I scratched my head and said, I have no idea what that's talking about. And there are some things that I read that I experienced some conviction on. There are times in my life when I have dreams and hopes, and you might read into Scripture something that's not there, for example. Now, I want to share just an example. Now, I don't know this to be true. Some of you know I've been working in hospice for a few years. This July will mark the 14th year that I've worked in hospice. Now, about a year or so ago, I was praying and searching for God to reveal to me, I guess, my next step, my next future. Now, here's what popped in my mind. There's a story in the Bible about one of the sons of Isaac. His name's Jacob. You may have heard of Jacob. I've read the story. I've preached the story. I've taught the story. And Jacob stole his brother, his slightly older brother. They were twins, and uh, he stole his birthright. And God blessed Jacob, and Esau said, I'm going to kill you because you robbed from me. So Jacob ran, and he ran far away. And as he ran far away, he went to his uncle's home, and he met there this beautiful woman named Rachel. He loved her. I mean, it was like love at first sight. And when he saw Rachel, he told his uncle, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll let me marry her. And Laban said, sure, done deal. They had a handshake. They agreed. Seven years came. Day of the wedding came. And guess what? Laban did not give Jacob Rachel. He gave him the older sister, Leah. Leah had an eye problem, by the way. She had like a wondering eye, a bad eye or something. Apparently it wasn't pleasant to look at. And uh, they had the wedding because of the custom of the day. He didn't know that was Leah until the next morning when they woke up together. I mean, imagine the shock, right? Whoa, 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 you're the wrong one. He went back to his uncle and said, you tricked me. And he said, tell you what, you work seven more years and I'll give you Rachel. So he did. Now, here's what I did. And here was the thought that popped in my mind. This July will mark the 14th year. Now, do you see how my brain's working? Seven is God's, in the scripture, seven, the number seven is God's number of perfection. You add seven plus seven, you get double perfection, right? So in my prayers, I don't know, sometime last year, this was my thought. God is going to do something incredible in my life in July of 2024. And I had it all figured out. Now, I'm going to pause there because here's what you can do just like I'm doing. Now, whether God does that amazing thing at that time, I have no idea. Now, I have no idea. God may, God may not. We can read into Scripture things that may be or may not be. And we have to be very, very careful how we read Scripture and how we interpret Scripture because we live in a world and we live in a day just like all the other time periods throughout history where the enemy, Satan, can confuse us, can get us off track, can whisper in our ear, things that may not be of God. So it's very difficult at times to truly discern and know God's will. 
And if we get our hope so set on something, and we are convinced that something is of God, and when it doesn't happen, your faith can be devastated, robbed. In a sense, you will be robbed of what God wants to pour into your life. There are a lot of people that don't read Scripture or study Scripture because, one, it at times is hard to understand. Scripture is hard to understand sometimes. I remember when I first became a follower of Jesus, even before that, when I read the Bible, I didn't understand hardly anything that I was reading. And then after I became a follower of Jesus, I still read some things and thought, what in the world is this talking about? What does this really mean? And, and what does it mean for me in my life? And, and even now, there are some things in Scripture, there are a lot of things in Scripture, when I read them, I'm still like, I don't know. You ever read the book of Revelation? That's some deep stuff. And, and you know, we, we want to understand it, and we want to know, and we want to figure it all out. But there are some things that God says, not now. Not now. So it's hard to understand. There are some people today that believe the Bible is an old and outdated book. Now, it is old. It's really old. There are some of the scriptures that were written over 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. And so, and the New Testament was written over 2,000 years ago. That's pretty old. But you know what? Times have changed. Customs have changed. We live in the United States of America. We're not Jewish. We're not Middle Eastern. We don't live in those days. Shucks, we don't even live in the 1700s of the United States. We don't dress like that. We don't talk like that. We don't act like that. But here's the, the reality of Scripture. Scripture is the unfolding story of God's life with me, you, and all of humankind. It is the story that God wants us to know so that we can know Him, understand Him, have a relationship with Him, and live a life that would honor Him all throughout our life. The book we call the Bible may be old, but the principles and the knowledge is not outdated. It still is relevant today. It is still the plan of God for us today. And there are people today, I read this on someone's uh, Facebook a couple of weeks ago, who had been accused of, you don't believe the Bible. Now, here's what I want you to hear very carefully. There are people today that will take some scriptures and say, that no longer applies to us today, including church leaders including ministers, including high-ranking ecclesiastical, ecle, I can't even say it, high-ranking weird people, okay? People who think and have the reputation they know and God has spoken, but God will never contradict His will for any generation when it comes to His Word. Sometimes reading the Bible and studying the Bible makes us uncomfortable. You know, we don't, we just don't want to feel uncomfortable. We want to be comfortable. In the room Rhonda and I at our home spend most of our time, there is a recliner that I sit in. Now, just for the record, it is my recliner. It's mine. Sometimes my back hurts, my lower back. So I have a pillow that sits on that said recliner because it gives me a little extra lumbar support. I like that recliner. And if somebody sits in it, I've been known to say, it's mine, get out. I don't always do that. And sometimes I go to another seat, but it's don't have the pillow there. I like to be comfortable. We all like to be comfortable. We like our life. And there are moments, however, when we say or do things that God says, that's great, that's amazing, you're on the right track. You're on the right path, and then there are those moments when we're on the wrong path. And God says, I need to make you a little uncomfortable right now. If life was always easy and life was always just like sitting on the rubber inner tube 
just moseying down the lazy creek, life would be great. We don't want, at times, the roller coaster rides. We don't want to be uncomfortable. And yet, in Scripture, if we're going to become more like Jesus, there are times we have to become uncomfortable in order to grow in our faith, in order to become the person God wants us to become, in order to experience God's best, then we have to learn to be a little uncomfortable at times. Because when we get uncomfortable, that's when we really begin to look in the mirror. And then another reason people don't really read the Bible today or study the Bible is they lack discipline. Discipline. We Many of you know for a while I was walking up to three miles a day. It turned cold. Rhonda retired from teaching. And then it was rainy. So when my schedule changed, and when it turned cold and rainy, I got up at 5.30 to go on my walk. And I said to myself, "Mm -mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Mm -mm, not doing that right now I ain't walking in the rain one day I went out it was so cold I turned around and came back in and went nope not today I've stopped walking my three miles but I need to start back again do you know why I stopped because I lacked discipline this is very transparent today I lacked discipline we don't read the Bible because we lack discipline. Sometimes we have to do something, and I'm putting myself in the boat, we have to do something to get into a discipline, and then we have to maintain and keep up that discipline. Because it's not enough to know what you read a year ago or a two years ago or three years ago. We have to keep reading and keep studying and keep listening and keep growing. Why is that so important? It is important, and I shared this verse of Scripture briefly last Sunday from uh, Colossians 2, verse number 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. You see, there are those in this world, our world, as it was in the generation before us and before and before and before, and for us, the generations in the future, there will always be this spiritual force in the world that will try to lead you and lead me away from the truth of who God is and the truth of what God wants us to do, the truth of who God wants us to become. And it's subtle, very, very subtle, and if we're not careful, if we don't really study the Bible and know and understand what God is saying to us, we will drift from the center, the place where God wants us to be. And then we will say, I am good when you're not good. I know that because I'm not walking like I used to, I don't have the energy I used to. So guess what I got to do? I got to get disciplined. And I got to get walking. But more importantly than physical exercise, the Bible reminds us that physical exercise is of no value to us if we are not growing spiritually. Spiritual exercise is more important than physical exercise. It's more important than eating healthy. It's more important than anything you or I will ever do this side of heaven. So with that said, I want to read from 1 Timothy. I said 1 Timothy. I meant 2 Timothy. Did I? I don't know what I said. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14, 15, 16, and 17. Paul the Apostle writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, 
for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now those words are indeed a mouthful. I want to summarize them and then give you some practical ways to help you grow deeper in your own personal Bible study. The first thing in this recap in verse 14, Paul reminded Timothy and us, don't abandon the truth of Scripture. Don't abandon it. Don't leave it. Don't lay it down. When he wrote, continue in what you've learned, and that word doesn't translate as clearly as it did in the original Greek, but to continue means never stop. Keep Keep on learning. Keep believing. Don't quit believing. Don't quit studying. Don't quit reading. Don't quit putting the scriptures in your mind and then take them from your mind into your heart. Continue and keep continuing to do that. And then he said, you know who taught you. They were trustworthy. And then he said in verse 15, and you know that from infancy you have had these scriptures. You see, the scriptures, Paul reminds us, is what points us to our, our real salvation, our real hope. He says, you've known the scriptures, and they gave you wisdom so that you could be saved from your sin, so that you could be saved from the damnation of hell itself because of what Jesus came to give and do for you. Jesus is and was and always will be the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. He's the fulfillment of it all. He is the only hope, the only way to heaven. There is no other way. And he says, keep learning about him. And you've known this, and you've known this for a really long time, since you were a young boy. And then he says, the scripture is profitable. It's good for something. You know, again, we may not like all scriptures. We may think the scripture is outdated. We may feel uncomfortable when we read certain passages. We may see all of those things, but the scripture gives us first and foremost, Paul wrote, knowledge, an understanding of who God is, an understanding of who Jesus is, an understanding of the plan of God, an understanding of how to live our life, an understanding of the whole picture that God is painting for us. And we get that in and through Scripture. There are a lot of questions that people have in this world today. Where did the world come from? How long did it take to build the world? How long did it take to create everything? Why did God do what he did? Why did Jesus come? Why are we sinners? Why is there good and evil in this world? Why? Uh, what about the ark? What about all those animals? How do they fit on that ark? What about dinosaurs? See, I could just keep going and going with all of the questions in this world. And the Bible may not answer some questions specifically, some things we accept by faith and through faith, but we understand that the Scripture helps us know and understand who God is and what God wants to do in our life. Through the ages, there have been people that have said, well, Scripture and science don't match up. Hmm. You might want to research that one a little more. Scripture is not a book of science, but the Scripture doesn't discount or defy science. But you know what the scripture does do when it comes to science? God is not bound by the laws of what we might call nature. This wonderful thing that we cannot see, but we enjoy and we need called gravity. Gravity is an amazing thing, isn't it? If I jump right now, I will fall back down or come back down. If I go to the moon and jump, guess what? Because of the gravitational pull, I can still jump up, but I'm still going to come down. But if I go in a spaceship and I am far away from any planet or moon, I'm going to float because there is no gravity. Strange, isn't it? And yet on every Star Trek and Star Wars film, when they're in their spaceships, they seem to walk around just fine. Go figure. It's not truth, is it? See, here's what I want you to see and understand. Scripture reminds us that God created everything that is. And God gave us this world upon which we live and enjoy. And, and science 
can explain some things, but God isn't bound to the laws of science. And that's why when we read in Scripture, we use this word called miracles. God uses His own power to defy what He created in order to say to some people and in some circumstances, see, I am God, I created and I can do what I want. If I want an axe head to float, the axe head will float in water. If I want three men to be cast into a fiery furnace and not be consumed by that fire and not even have the smell of smoke on their bodies, I can do that because I am God and I am the Creator. If I want Daniel to be thrown into a lion's den who are hungry and really, really hungry, I will shut their mouths and not allow them to hurt him. If I want my son to live a perfect life on the earth and then freely, willingly give his life on a cross and then have him buried in a tomb and raised the third day to defeat death, then I can do that. See, God says, yes, there is science, but I have come because I am God. I can do as I choose. So God wants us to know that Scripture gives us knowledge about God. The Scripture also is good for uh, rebuking. We don't really use that word a lot today in our world. I mean, I, I mean, every now and then, I rebuke you. I mean, you ever had somebody come up to you and say, you're being rebuked? We don't normally do that. Another way to think of rebuking is reprimand. We reprimand. I'm going to tell you what you just did wrong. If you're married, you may be reprimanded. I did not identify whether it was the woman doing it or the man doing it. If you are a parent, you often reprimand your children. Sometimes you may reprimand a child not your own. If you are driving too fast and the fellow with the blue lights pulls you over, you're going to be reprimanded. You see, reprimanding is a part of life. In other words, laws exist and, and things in families exist to help us stay within certain acceptable limits. Let's just say it this way. If there is a child, say, eight years of age, and that child comes to his mom or her mom, doesn't matter, he, her, either male or female, and they get sassy. You ever seen a sassy kid? You know, one of those kids that says, I'm not going to do that. Or, you don't, you don't matter. You can't make me do anything. Hmm. When I was a kid, and I did do that occasionally with my mom and dad, I lived now to tell about it. But there was a time or two when I wasn't sure if I was going to live to tell about it. Because my mom and dad said, oh no, we don't do that. So if we know that parents reprimand their children, if we know that in the school system, children are reprimanded if we know in the court system that criminals or the accused are reprimanded for their crimes is it not logical also for those of us who understand the will of God and the plan of God to not also be reprimanded to put us on the straight and narrow path to do what is best for us and those around us there are people today that say oh God is love God is forgiving. God is caring. And yes, God is. But God also has expectations of how we should live our lives, of how we should conduct ourselves, of how we should treat each other, of how we should honor and respect Him as well as other people. And so in this scripture and all throughout scripture, we're reminded that God wants us to or needs us to be reprimanded. But the next one is correction. It's not enough to be told that's not right none of us like to be told that do we well that's not right but the scripture is also for our benefit to be corrected we have to correct the behavior that God says no to or the behavior God wants us to do we need to be reprimanded in order for 
us to correct that behavior. And then finally, he says that Scripture is given to us for the purpose of training. We have to be trained to walk in the path of Jesus. Now, with all of this said, I want you to hear something very clearly now. Paul is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He's writing these words to a young preacher named Timothy. 2 Timothy is the last book, the last letter that Paul ever wrote in his life before he gave his life as a martyr. He's writing to young Timothy. God said, Paul, write this letter to Timothy. This book has been preserved for all of us today, and it talks about the Scripture. And guess what? In the day that Paul lived, in the day that Timothy lived, and Matthew, and Luke, and Mark, and John, and all of the others. You know what scripture they had? It was the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't yet written, or it was in the process of being written. So Paul is talking about this scripture being the Old Testament, and now today God has given, this, given us this beautiful gift of the Old and the New to help us learn more about Him so that we could live a life that honors him. You see, the last verse, verse number 17, he says, so that you may be complete and equipped. God wants us to be complete, equipped, so that we can do and become the person that he wants us to become. That's what God wants. And so with, if this is to happen, you may be asking, well, that's great. But I don't always understand the Bible. I don't really want to read it because I can't understand it. Or I don't want to read it and study it because, hmm, you see, it doesn't make me feel good sometimes. Well, I'm going to challenge you. If you want to grow deeper and if you want to experience God's best, then you've got to grow deeper in your Bible study because it is the book where you really learn what God wants, expects, and dreams for you in your life. So how do you do that? I'm going to give you three quick things. First one is this. When you get up, before you go to bed, whenever you're most alert, before you read, say a simple prayer. God, help me understand what I'm about to read. Now, I could have said, find a plan. I would probably say, don't start with the book of Revelation. Don't start with the book of Leviticus. Don't start with the book of Numbers. Why? Because they're bad books? No, they're not bad books. They're just, they're just harder to understand. If you've never really read the Bible much before, if you've never really studied the Bible, I would encourage you to start with the book of John, John's Gospel. Start with John. Start in chapter 1 and read through. Or you can follow the plan that we put in the newsletter every week. We've been reading through the book of Matthew right now. Matthew's another great place to start. Mark's a great place to start. Luke's a great place to start. But start somewhere and then begin with prayer. God, help me understand what I'm about to read. Jesus said this in John 16, 13. He says, when I am gone meaning I've ascended back to heaven, I will send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will help you understand the truth of God's Word. In other words, we need to say, Holy Spirit, God, help me understand what I'm about to read today. God, help me get something out of this Word today. Help me Figure out and hear your voice. Help me, God, see what I need to change in my own life so that I can become that person you really want me to be. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. You're just saying, God, help me understand this today. Help me understand it today. Isn't that, isn't that great? You're going to start your Bible reading with the prayer. And the second thing, and this one is a little more challenging, you have to understand the context of the word that you're reading now here's what I mean by context everything in life has a context here's what I mean by that me and Rhonda in our life we live in an ever-changing mode of context she has thoughts and I have thoughts 
I have plans, she has plans, and sometimes these plans are the same. And then there are times they're not the same. This is just a little example, y'all. She doesn't know about this, okay? I mean, she does know about it, but she doesn't know I'm going to share it. Here's the context. She hasn't felt well. She's been recovering. And guess what? I was aware of the context. Y'all understand? You're with me so far? I was aware of the context. And there are moments in my life when, as a man, I say things that I don't necessarily mean but come out the wrong way. Are you with me? Men are laughing. Women are not. Ladies, we're sorry. We're, we can't. This is, this is part of the context, see? The context is what's going on in Rhonda's life, what's going on in my life, what thoughts are in my brain that I have not verbally expressed, what, are going, what thoughts are in her brain that she has not verbally expressed, and herein is the beauty of communication. There are moments we think we're communicating and we're not always communicating. And there have been some moments when I said something and as soon as it came out, I went, oh, that didn't come out good. Or that didn't come out right. And then there have been some things that I've said that I thought was perfectly fine and, and it wasn't interpreted correctly. It doesn't mean she's right, she's wrong, I'm right, she, I'm wrong. It just means it has to deal with context. So scripture was written in a context. And we have to understand the context to understand the meaning of what's going on. Have you ever heard someone say something and you only heard a part of what they said? You didn't hear what was said before it or after it? You only heard a little bit and you misinterpreted what was being said? People do that with Scripture all the time. We, we have to, when we read Scripture and study Scripture, we need to know what happened before the verse we just read. We need to understand what was said after what we just said. We may need to understand who the author of the book was, the human author. We may, we may even need to understand a little bit of the history of the time. We may need to understand a little bit about the culture. We may need, See, this is, this is where Bible study gets real. We need to step back and ask a lot of questions. Who wrote it? Why was it written? What was going on? What was the big problem? What was said before? What was said after? What happened in this whole scenario so that we can understand the entire context? What was the purpose? Why is that important? I cannot remember. It's really, really old. And I just don't remember who said it and how it was exactly said. But here's the essence of it. People might read in Scripture about a person, one or two verses, and then read something else, and then they make a conclusion. But the way this old joke went was, Judas hung himself, go and do thou likewise. Now that's just stupid, right? But see, people will read an isolated verse out of context and then read something else and go, oh, that's what I got to do. Remember my first initial story? Seven, God's number of perfection. Times two, 14, don't have that many fingers. And I jumped to this conclusion of what God, God might do. Actually, it was what God will do. But God may not do that. Why? Because if I take something out of context, if I take something that happened here and then apply it to my life and make it truth, it may not happen. And if it may not happen, and I clung to that so deeply, then my faith will be challenged. And see, the same is true for you too. We have to understand, God, help me understand what I'm studying and reading and help me understand the original context and how that applies to me today. And the last thing I would encourage you to do is this. God gave us teachers, godly teachers. It's a, it's a spiritual gift. Find someone 
who can help you understand scriptures you may not understand. Remember what Paul said to Timothy in the very first verse I read, verse 14, he says, continue in what you've learned, learned, and he says, and those who taught you. There are people in your life that you need to, to learn from. People in your life who can help guide you. If you're going astray, they can help you say, now, wait a minute, you, you've, you've not understood the context. Or maybe you don't understand the context. You find someone, call someone, shoot me an email, call me and ask me, hey, I've been reading this and I don't understand. It makes no sense. Could you help me understand what's going on here? I will help you do that. Find a good Sunday school teacher, someone who studied the Bible. Go online and don't just ask Google. Please don't ask Google. There's a lot of crazy teachers out there a website that I would recommend for you when you have questions you don't understand or about context I should put it up on the screen it's too late but it's very simple gotquestions.com g-o-t questions q-u-e-s-t-i-o-n-s dot com type in their website gotquestions.com they've got a little search bar you can ask your question and they'll give you a whole list of articles that those who have been studying scriptures for a long time can help you understand context, who will help you understand history, who will help you understand those difficult and challenging passages. So in other words, find somebody who can help you learn what scripture means. And if someone tells you, I have all the answers. Run, run, run from them as quickly as you can because not everyone has all the answers. If someone, for example, and I'll close with this, tells you, I know when Jesus is returning. I know when the second coming's coming. No, they, they don't know. Run from them. They're a false teacher. So in other words, you, me, we need to be very careful who we listen to, but we can't do this alone. We do this together. And as we grow deeper in our understanding of Scripture, God will begin to change you, change and mold and shape you into the image and the person God wants you to become. You will become more like Jesus. You'll never become Jesus because there's only one Jesus, but you will become more like him in character and will and passion. So my prayer is that you will grow deeper in your scripture. And I'm challenging you this week. If you're not reading the Bible daily, I'm challenging you this week. Make a time, set a time, and read scripture.